I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome back to Unashamed. We got to, this is a happening. This is. This is a happening. Zach is here. It's a big day. In studio. We had to get him positioned over there. It only took us 30 minutes. <laughs> 30 minutes yeah. to get him in his spot. And uh, I've been told not to turn to the right or the left. <laughs> Just so, like, stay straight arrows. Uh, this is like this is like your spiritual life is straight arrow. So welcome in studio, Zach. It's always good to have you down. So t- tell everybody what, can you tell everybody what you're doing here this week? Yeah, we're just doing a little bit of uh, movie prep stuff. So we're, I'm down here for the week. Yep. Movie prep. Yeah, we got a movie. You working coming. on a movie? We got a movie coming out, <laughs> oh, Jace. <Jackson. okay. laughs> we we've we've only announced it about five yeah. times Thanks on the, the podcast. Uh, endorsement, Jace is right. Jace, you can go to. He's the, right on the cutting edge, that Jace. Yeah, you can go to theblindmovie.com dot com and put your name in, and you'll get. Uh, we'll give you updates on what we're doing. Oh, I thought I was. You were going to say they were going to send me a prize or something in the <laughs> might, mail. Yeah, we might do that. Go to. <laughs> yeah, yes. we may just uh, <laughs> randomly select some people. You may you may get a. Um, Oh, this is a movie by Phil. Okay, well, I forgot about it. A lot, a lot of this, I've been busy. You have been busy. Did y'all miss me? I wasn't we did. Here. We we told everybody we were sending you out for stories uh, and and, ha- and musings because we we like it when when you get out there in the world and. No, I've interact. noticed y'all have become like kind of like my marriage. They're just it's not very often, but every once in a while, you know, you just need some space. <laughs> <laughs> just, you, you, just a minute. Just, just. I'm trying minute. to find that Bible verse. You need some space. Well, <laughs> it was y'all's idea. It sounds not mine. like the Apostle Paul. People who marry will face many troubles in this Here life. We go. I, want, I want to spare you this. No, for the record, I said I will be here. I will. I will phone in, and y'all said <laughs> no. <laughs> So I took that to mean we just, <laughs> we, just we just need a little space. And we, had, we had we did jail. talk about you. I understand. Yeah. So we had we had Cy and Stone on Jace, and uh, I bet that was interesting. It was, and what was really interesting is that once we got going and talking about, we went way back. Uh, oh. Cy and I heard some stories I'd never heard before. You know, he's hit another gear. Nobody else had either. No, that's what I'm saying. He's hit another (laughs) gear. The last time I talked to him, I heard at least five new stories. Yeah. I was like, Sa. Yeah. uh, He he said they would play marbles, and they would shoot the marbles, and they would spin. He said they had so much force (laughs) that they would... Spin so fast they, they would, would bore- bury themselves in the wooden floor. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be in they were going so he fast. A little out of line on that one. <laughs> no, hey, Phil. Hey. hey, what he meant to say was there was as boys, young children, the mar- shooting marbles was top, top of the heap. You know what's one That's of that's what all children hey. did, males. No, no girls, no girls. At no. most sites I go <laughs> treasure hunt. Do you know? That I find a marble or two everywhere I go. I have a whole box full of them. How do you find marbles with a metal detector? They're laying on top of the ground because the tractor plows them up. Okay, and yeah, I have many. I have found many. So that's so you aren't you your crew wasn't the only one with the marbles. That was a no. That's just what yeah. to Phil's point. Yeah, a marble holds up well, and a hundred years ago, yeah, everybody played marbles because so they're all look, over the ground. They found. News got out about somebody who passed on in the Robertson clan, but and some one of my cousins got word that there were some marbles in behind some boards in that old log cabin we were all raised in. Somebody had put them in there, and they were there. It was marbles been there for 40, 50 years, right. a stash of marbles. It was a coveted thing back in the day. When we were kids. Is this something like driving? Like once you, so if we'd like brought marbles, could you still go back in the zone? Oh, like, it was a skill on what you could do with your thumb when you were, you know, and you, you'd knock theirs out of the way if you could hit it right, and yours would still stay there. With That one you knocked out of the way got outside the circle. You, you pocketed that. Well, we just kept strapping it on. Dead by the marbles, they had the money. We No one had a dime coming from out in the woods. <laughs> When we migrated to town, marble playing was the way we got so marble play back is, at at. Uh, it's like one of those things when you eat six subs, what do you get? Another sub. Yeah, <laughs> marbles like okay, we got a big pile of marbles, but 
could you sell them or I mean was there I'm trying trading. to figure out oh, trade trade trade, trade oh. marbles for Coca Colas and trade yeah. marbles. Yeah, I'm seeing all this in the ground. When Currency. you said we didn't have a dime, you're seeing it in the ground. But you say where did marbles dime, come from? If you had a dime and lost it, because that's what I'm mainly finding: dimes and marbles. Your your record as a male human being, young person, was how well you played marbles. Boy, that's <laughs> that's depressing. <laughs> Times have changed. Just, I'm just telling you what the code was. Well, yeah, I know. I was just thinking, dream bigger. I mean, there was a <laughs> there was a statement you'd make when you shot with your thumb. You put your hand on the ground, you got a circle, you put all your marbles, somehow they ended up in a circle, but you would go around, and when you hit theirs, you, you had to hit theirs without touching yours. Mm. Boom. And you knocked theirs out of like, the circle, and you would say nothing. Pool. You would, nothing. Well, you like, you would say nothing? Us. You'd say nothing, meaning I got yours, but mine's still there. I got shot number two. <laughs> Is that how you said it? Nothing. 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 And you nothing. tried to rub it in a little bit? Nothing. So at what point did you start rolling on the, on the ground fighting over a marble dispute? Oh, I guarantee there was some fights. The fight. fighting came later, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody started playing football. Hey, let's get it. <laughs> Bring back the marble. Bring back the yeah, well, with us, it was, yeah, I remember it was dominoes. It was spades. Yep. It was yeah. It was cards. Yep. Yeah, cards. Uh, a lot of that. Sometimes Monopoly. Now I've you're seen, getting up I've into seen a lot of teenage, fights with Monopoly. Right. Mm -hmm. You're getting into the teenage, childhood, children. No, get them out of the way. No, it's <laughs> now serious the, to game. For now them. the cell phone has been introduced and it just yeah. killed and, and the, the video games. game. Yeah, and the, and video, the video game. Games. I've never been the same since cell phones came along. <laughs> well, Phil, you'd never changed you a bit. It changed me. I, I changed me in my head on what oh. people do about one device yeah. getting that involved in it. It was just too much, way too much. Yeah. For young people, way, way too much. You either have to censor it or cut out whatever, yeah. all these wicked things. That's on well, the you know, it's funny. I, I thought about that when listening to you and Side Talk. I thought, you know, it is interesting. You got two characters here that have more personality and creativity than just about anybody I know. But to hear you, how you grew up, barbed wire fences and wasp things on the butt and marbles and no cell phone needed you didn't have any of that i mean you guys no. are i mean there's something to be said for that yeah we Jay, still don't have anything for jace them. asked dad i said so how did this how did the your love for hunting begin and he said poaching <laughs> well yeah <laughs> we didn't own any land i just wasn't expecting poaching <laughs> and the people who did Bad answer <laughs> we never stole anything like equipment firearms motors trinkets nothing all as long as it fell off of trees it was in right we could pick them up we we, we the, took that the as almighty that's how you justified that we justified, <laughs> justified theft of pecans <laughs> peaches <laughs> watermelons fair game rose it, it is interesting that now as landowners we have a little different <laughs> <laughs> a little different perspective. No, yeah, I'm sure. are you, are you, what are you doing here? <laughs> what, well, well, I'm just here because the Almighty <laughs> provided it. <laughs> We're going to talk about that later. That's right. The Lord needs it. That's yeah, exactly right. Absolutely. Let's change it. So, Jay, so you had to, you enjoyed your uh, days off? Or what, you're, you're kind days of, off? <laughs> no, there was no day <laughs> off. The only reason I wasn't here is because we were working on our other venture, mm -hmm. the treasure hunting on camera. Right. And, uh, you know, it was a blur. I've been all over. I mean, I've been various states, and too much happened for me to really, uh, one thing doesn't stick out, but we basically went coast to coast. Right. So I think it's going well, though. I, I, you know, you never know how these things uh, are going to turn out because it's mostly off the top of your head and yeah. just... You go out there, and who knows where this is going to lead. I think it's going to be good. Some of the <clears throat> things you've told me about that we can't talk about on here, I think it's going to be funny and good. No, that's exciting. Yeah. What else so, is happening? What else is happening? Uh, duck season's fixed to be here. Yeah. We're five days out. Are you excited yet? I've been excited for about a week. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> that's good. The excitement I hasn't hit I was doing me it yet. all as a lot of work. Yeah, you know, putting in dumps, dams, pumps, this, that, and the other. It, it, at one time, I'm like, whew, man, I must be getting old around here because this, this, just to get that this thing ready to duck hunt is quite the, 
quite the job. And you actually have way more help now than you used to have. More, way more. Stone and his crew. Yep. Dad, so the way I describe it <clears throat> to audiences around the country, when I'm talking about our family, is you're like a five-year-old on Christmas Eve on the night before duck season, right? I mean, you still have that same Watching the wonder. sun come up Saturday morning, and you start hearing these ducks, and way off in the distance, I said, uh-oh. I said, I hear some somebody just emptied a gun on that bunch. <laughs> They're over there in the Delta, yeah. rice country. We're in the woods. The right wind's coming this way, so that sound's traveling. Wind's right. We say, good night. They're, they're, they're. Get ready. They're coming. When we hear gunfire in the distance, that means you have a better chance because they're stirring them. Well, last night at 1030, I heard something. I walked out on my porch, and, I mean, it had to have been a huge bunch of speckle bellies yep. coming across. And they a sure been, sign It must have been fairly flight. low because they were loud. Sure sign of a flight. When you hear the speckle bellies, you say it's on like a chicken no, I bone. saw them a couple of days ago. I, I told you about this before we started filming. It was about an hour before dark. I was on a huge river, and I just looked up, and it was like the migration was happening. Because, you know, it, all of a sudden, it went from being hot and a drought yeah. to cold, cold everywhere. Cold. Yep. And I saw them ducks bunch after bunch after bunch. And so they were trying to film and I was like, hang on. I said, hold, hold up. And they're like, what? I was like, I'm watching the migration happen. Yeah. I said, y'all need to film this. Get ready for our, uh, the Canadian national anthem. And they oh, were, oh, Canada. We, that's <laughs> no, where all the ducks are coming yeah. from. Oh, Did you break be, out in song? That was too. Yeah, that was too fast. I, I went, tell Canadians every time I meet them, oh, I tell them. Oh, Canada. <laughs> yeah. That's how I start. Yeah. Well, I didn't know how to wear the Did you meet the or... couple yesterday at church from Saskatchewan? Yep. 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 They we, were down. We, we talked ducks a little bit. We had two baptisms, which was good. So the, the guy, one of the praise uh, guys told me that they lo- he looked over his shoulder. They're practicing, getting ready for our deal and you slipped in the water they didn't even know you were back there you baptized somebody and then so they were singing and you said hey keep the singing going and you asked the woman you were about to baptize what's your favorite song yep. she said amazing grace so they just went into the, she's the, standing in the baptism pool and mm-hmm. i took advantage of the situation to our song people the, the singers i said keep that going while they're standing down here because they're fixed to be born again and have eternal life. So, yeah. so God. Weatherford, you know, our, our old pal Weatherford, he was telling me that. So they're singing this. Yeah, they were just looking at me when I was telling. Right. Them. <clears throat> so he's talking to this woman, explaining what she's doing, and they're singing "Amazing Grace." My chains are gone. That verse, and he said, she goes down in the water, and when she comes out, they hit the "My chains are gone." You know, so yeah. in that moment, and Weatherford said, "My chills got chills." Yeah. You know, and you <laughs> know mean, what the woman did. She wept. Yeah. I thought, what a cool serendipity that was. I mean, they just happened to be up there practicing when Dad was baptizing these folks. And We had covered the gospel, which is all I cover every week anyway. I just cover the gospel. And all these texts that we read in the book of Mark, we're in chapter 8, but... We're fixing to get into. No, we're it. We're in chapter eight. eleven. <laughs> Dad, you may be in chapter okay, eight. We've moved well, on to I'm chapter. I'm climbing 11. up in the rear because <laughs> it was cha- it was all the way to chapter eight before they said Jesus said is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise from the dead. Well, here we that's go. What I, that's what I told the people then. As I pointed to the to the arrow coming down out of heaven, I said, "Here he comes! Look what's waiting for him! A cross! Look at a tomb! It's empty now. He he rose from the dead." So, two said, "We want in," and then three more after that. So let's let's take a break. Our family has been uh, very active in the pro life movement, and we kind of do it from different perspectives, which is great. Uh, Jason, Missy, and others have, and Zach have done fostering and adoption, which all these are are so important because life is not just about being born; it's the process through. We want to make sure yeah. that lives uh, matter and you know have meaning in their lives. So Lisa and I do a lot on the front end. 
And so we, we love to walk alongside other organizations that have that same passion for life as we do. And 40 Days for Life is one of those groups. They have um, over a million volunteers in a thousand cities. Uh, they hold peaceful prayer vigils outside of abortion facilities. Uh, really a prayer as a target to try to make a difference in people's lives. They have a couple of numbers um, that are important, kind of in post row America. Former Planned Parenthood directors say that these peaceful vigils can cause the abortion no-show rate to go as high as 75% which is great. So that's the decision made to not even go to the abortion clinic. Another one is that they've been able to accomplish with the vigils. They've closed 106 abortion businesses in America, and 45% of those closed facilities were in blue states, you know, where obviously abortion is, is, remains legal. So it's changing the hearts and mind. We want you to check out their locations, their podcast, their free magazine at 40daysforlife.com to stay updated uh, on abortion in post row America. So that's four zero. 40daysforlife.com. Check them out. Oh, there was three more. Uh, <coughs> three spoke. more after hey, my sermon. There you go. So, so just to mention this, because there were some came late yesterday and they said, man, I had no idea. So all of our listeners out there. So every Sunday, dad does a class. We call it the Unashamed Bible Study because of our podcast. And he, so he teaches that every Sunday at nine o'clock. So if you're ever coming through here, Make sure you get here at nine. They'll tell you where to go to hear dad. But I mean, every week. And the good news is with both you and myself, we don't mind other people doing what they got to do, but it's free. It is. It's free of charge. No money changes hands. We're volunteers, which is volunteers. So, so we're actually in Mark chapter 11. Jace, we got 10, uh, the rest of 10 while you were gone. And we're, it was perfect with you coming back in because we're at a really pivotal shift yeah, that Mark is in the, in our story. That made me think of a question. If you only had a week to live, what would that look like? Well, Jesus again predicts his death. It's chapter 10, about verse 34, 35, 32. The Son of Man will be betrayed to the hand of... He's, he's announced that a few days earlier. He repeats it repeatedly. Everything begins to change and to shift to a new dynamic. <clears throat> One thing is to say, I'm going up to Jerusalem, I'm going to die, and I'm going to fall victim to the hands of the most religious people on the earth that I've been going back and forth with here this whole time. And I've got people writing down what's taking place. And here's what I'm fixing to do. One plot thing is to predict that. Yeah, I'm going to die, guys. I'm, you know, it's coming up. And then I'm all, they're going to bury me. In three days, I'll be raised from the dead. I mean, that's quite the statement. And and just keep right on talking and doing what you've been doing. That's quite the statement to interject. Oh, by the way, I'm fixing to die, be buried, and raised from the dead. And they're all standing there looking at each other saying, because they were thinking, well, you're going to do what? Uh, the pivot here was it subtly happened at the end of chapter 10. I don't know if y'all talked about this, but when the blind man is on the road and he's hollering out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He's, you know, the son of David is declaring this is, this is the coming king right. that was to come. Yep. And so this is the first time that he wasn't trying to make that a secret anymore. He's now that is correct. gone public, and he does two things. Now, Mark doesn't record one of them, but we know, I think they all record about the uh, coming in on a colt of a donkey. Yep. But Jesus actually orchestrated that. All of a sudden, that's the biggest pivot. It's like he went from saying, keep this a secret, it's not the time, hang on, don't tell anybody about this, to now mm. saying, go down here, you'll find a colt. Yeah. And so he 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 is announcing the king is here. All right. Yep. <clears throat> so he's being acknowledged by it, and he's not, I mean, he's like, call him, bring him over here, the guy, you know, and he and he actually healed him. And he does that, and then there was, when he got needed the upper room, he said, go down there, you'll find a guy carrying a jar. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a crazy thing. And he's like, I've already, he's already made all the preparations for you. And so you remember what, what happened there. So what I thought I'd do, uh, you know, I asked this question. I mean, we always say if you only had a. And my week, answer week would be, leave. I would, my urgency 
would would move to the four. If I knew I had a week to live, to answer your live, question, yeah. if it were me, I mean, all of a sudden, we know, right? If you knew that, it would definitely pick up. Well, your- what if you asked it this way? <laughs> what if you only had a week to die? Because mm. actually, we say that. We say, well, what happens if you only had a week to live? But But the reality is... You only have a week until you, you die. die. <laughs> yeah. Plus. Jesus actually is the only person that had, he had a week to die and to live. Yeah. Plus the the, the key little text, Jace, while you're there, he looked around after his resurrection and he said, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth. Has been given to me. Yeah. Well, this is post resurrection. Yeah. Because he had just fulfilled what he said he was going to do. He yeah. did it to the letter. Well, and that's but, what. Therefore, that, go make disciples. <clears throat> I think. Yeah. It's, I think it's a key. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's really yeah. simple. I think it's a key point that you made there, though, that Jesus orchestrates this oh, know, yeah. event of the trifle entry. And I think that matters because I think often we want to, when we think about the crucifixion of Jesus and what he's heading, because this is the last seven days, seven days of his life or death or however you want to say it. You know, this is the end, right? In other words, he had to die to save the world and he outlines the entire thing before it happened. Yeah. And he, and and he was sovereign over it. That's the thing. He, yeah, it, it wasn't, I mean, we want to think this is something that happened to Jesus but this is something that he was willingly like walking into, like he was in. Yeah, he orchestrated. I, I think orchestrates a good word. Yeah, I mean, I really that you know, I read this. What I, I was surprised by a couple of things. One is when you break out the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and look how much of the ink was devoted to this last week. Mm-hmm. That is the main thrust of all four gospels. Yeah, I mean, you just think we're in chapter eleven. We're going all the way to. 16 of four men 16. have written we, we, we've gone through we've gone through two thirds of the book of mark so now we have the one third left and the the last third of the book of mark is about seven days exactly and the whole book yeah. of technically john, and the eight. whole book of john yeah i mean he john just picks up the last by the way in the midst of all that technically eight because in the midst that, of all that, that day is a doozy oh yeah. yeah in the midst of all that why did he what, what was when he said jesus wept yeah, you know, we we. we what, well, what that's was, a good point, Phil. Because now, look, I think I think this <clears throat> setting this up the last week. There's a couple things happen. One, one I just pointed out. He's willing to go public. Uh, him being king. Now, him going public. When you read uh, Matthew's version, off the top of my head, I think it's 21. He actually says the king would come. He quoted. Zachariah, that again, that's off the top of my head, so I may be getting the quote wrong, but it said he will cut the king will come gently because he was a humble king. But all these people being gathered around were from Bethany and Bethpage, which is look, these are the people because Lazarus, who you just mentioned, yeah. that's when Jesus wept, and Mary and Martha, he was spending a lot of time there. These are his people. And so like with the guy, when he says, go down here, the guy with the colt, tell him the Lord needs it. Well, these are Jesus's people. Yeah. They all have realized, oh, he, he he's well, the guy. How, how can you prove that he's the son of God and fix to do this? He said, but he's riding up on a donkey. So these were his closest friends. And look, what I believe is that the reason Jesus wept, even though he was fixing to raise Lazarus from the dead, was that these were his closest friends when when we hurt when they hurt yeah he he was moved by that are you talking about when he wept over Jerusalem yeah there's one yeah well, one I thought of, yeah. you were talking about when he, he wept was talking about I was just saying why did he have to weep either in Luke or or Matthew's account as he's uh, riding yeah. in he right. weeps yeah. oh yeah yeah again yeah. and and I think it's but I think it's, your point is the same whether yeah. it was him weeping at Lazarus or this it's the idea it's the emotion of the moment. I mean, he's saving I mean, the this, world. This is it. Up. But, and, but and, and, and John it. eleven. In John eleven, you have the story of of Lazarus, and it's actually in this exact town, this village. What it says here of the triumphal entry as they approached Jerusalem at at uh, Bethage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, "Go into the village opposite of you, and immediately 
As you enter it, you will find a colt tied there on which no one yet has uh, ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. So the place they went was actually the town that Mary, when she anointed Jesus' feet, like that, that's where they lived. So he did have relationships in this town, which makes sense of maybe why he, if, if he did orchestrate this, you kind of see there's a history there. You right. know? Let's, let's take a break. Well, and an, another thing is, you, when we get to Mark, was it 13, when he's going to describe what's going to happen to this city? You know, if you think about Jesus, he's in a he's in a body, he's here, he's in time. But remember, he was outside time before he became one yeah. of us. And so he already knows what's going to happen to Jerusalem. Yep. And it's very bad what's going to happen there. That is correct. Be- and look, so a lot of people that, that obviously he wants to cross over are not going to, and it's going to be a bloodbath there. Yeah. In 70. So I've always thought maybe that's one of the reasons. Here's the Jew well. of all Jews because he wrote the law right. and dies to get him out from under what he had them write down. <laughs> Try to convince them, you never kept it. Right. Well, it was just a big, this, this is the cosmic change of, that's it. of our world here. Oh. And, and the, he's lived his life and become a human in humility to do this. I mean, there's a lot of details of what these next seven days are that are very moving yeah, and are, are, and are very curious. Even the idea of him being, I was making the point about him being a gentle king. I mean, now don't ever doubt it. He, he has the power, but he, he basically came here and he's weeping in, in moments, which just doesn't sound very kingly. And I thought about this, even the idea of coming in on a donkey colt, any other king, if they went into battle riding a donkey coat, well, they they they're gonna be the first one to die. You know what well, I mean? You can't control well, it. They would want one of these stallions. You remember what I mean? Well, think of was the uh, the member of the Eastwood movie with oh two him. mules for Sister Sarah. Yeah, or whatever. That, I thought that you know with that you, little ding 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 ding. Here comes the king riding into battle, <laughs> riding a little coat. The ding 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 ding. ding, ding, ding he's ding. dead. I mean, because you just you're an easy target, and they're uncontrollable, yeah. and, and it's just not powerful. You talk about going up hills, dodging. And arrows or spears or and and even when you look when you mention the triumphal entry you know the people who i guess who produce these bibles you know they put that heading up there i mean jesus didn't say i'm fixing to make my triumphal entry that that's what we put but when you look at it the world would laugh at that of all the introductions of a king this has to be the most huh. eye raising Eye rolling entry of all times. You're I'm like, oh, you. this is what you're going with—a bunch of poor people. And who was the you prophet some... that predicted he would ride up on a donkey? What? That was Zechariah. Yeah, but, then, but then also, if you look at the others, even what the people were saying was Isaiah, Jeremiah. So all of this initial scene yeah. is that this had been predicted. How in the world would hundreds the, of years earlier? I think it was probably pretty powerful. I think it was a moment where um, it was like a populist uprising. I think that's probably the. But I scene. think it was his people. It was these, his people. Yeah, these people had. You got to remember, he had just raised Lazarus from the dead, so the excitement level was off the charts from those communities, and that's why he was, why he kept going over there. I mean, they, these that they got it, and so once he became public, I mean, they're like, we're going to take over the world now. Granted, yeah, because he's up to this point. To your to your point, he's been saying, "Don't tell anybody. Exactly. Don't tell anybody. Like, Let's go. Don't tell anybody." And now this now he's orchestrating the moment where he's going to be like, "Yep, they're they're like this is it. We're fixed to and he yeah. did we're fixed tell to him. crush Rome. We got all the things in place. This guy can raise dead people. He did he did prep them because in the chapter thirteen, after he said all this has changed, he come riding up. He was leaving the temple. One of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Well, they've already heard him say he's going to die, be buried, and raised. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. They were like, they were just well, yeah. stunned. They were like, oh, so you, let's, what? So, so you can do, you got your eight So days. let's do this. So I, cause, cause here's, here's what's hard. And I think this is why a lot of people uh, have misunderstandings about what's fixed to happen. 
because you have four different writers writing what happened, but they're writing from different perspectives. Is it, you get four eyewitnesses telling you basically the same thing, but among the scholarly world, a lot of these things seem a little off time-wise. So I'm going to give you just the general outline of what happened the next seven days, because that's what we're going to cover. Because you got to remember, most of these people, even the followers of Jesus, didn't get it until day eight. Mm -hmm. They it, they just didn't get it. Right. Because nothing is making sense. You're going to be a king. We're going to take over the world, but you're coming riding on a donkey. And dying? And talking about, you know, <laughs> loving your enemies and uh, yeah. what? I mean, it, it just does. You're fixed to die and be never heard of like everybody else that's ever died. Well, <laughs> yeah, it, it's not making sense. He's predicting his death. So you got day one. You have the the as we we dubbed it, I guess, the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. He's on the unbroken colt, uh, but he's a humble king. It, it's humble. It's an interesting arrival for a king, let's put it yeah. that way. It's not what and, we... And a predicted one. I mean, so that's part of it. So too. then he goes that night, he spends the night back in Bethany, we're at the home of, we're assuming this. Yeah. Some of these are assumptions. I, I'm saying I, the timeline might be off one or two days because there are disagreements about... So that's where exactly Mary, when. Martha, and Lazarus live. But in. don't miss the point. Right. Don't miss the <clears throat> overall point. So day two, which would have been Monday... He's back on to Jerusalem, and he encounter. He has this moment with this fig tree, and we'll talk about that, you know, when we get there. Yeah. But there's a couple that that share that. I can't read my writing here. Oh, he overturned the temple, the tables in the temple. Remember the den of robbers? You turned. So right. he goes to the temple, does that, and he inspected the temple courts. It says that, and so he walked around. He's looking. So back to Bethany that night. Same thing. Right. I mean, it's like a which in, which in Mark's account, yeah. He he, it, it kind of falls off. Like a, a lot of people say, it's an anticlimactic conclusion to this entry. He just goes to the temple and like looks around. You know, and right. it's just kind of like what? <laughs> you know, it it like, is. It is interesting. I thought the same thing. So day three, Tuesday, he passes back by the, the withered tree, which I think they on purpose are giving you this image. Of him, of what happened, which right. is him going back. Yeah, this is the week. This is how he. This is how That's he's right. spending his last week here in in this moment. He's going to the people as you cover that. Put their Jace, trust on him. Give yeah. him the the chapter and verse. Well, the problem is, I'm just combining all four gospels. All right, you, all you right. see what I mean? So, because some of them don't have this, he's just painting the big picture. I'm painting the big picture, and then because we're going to go into the details once we get in. So he goes back to the uh, the temple. Now, this time, he gives them the powerful, you know, sermon about you son of vipers and you remember all that. So now we had a we had a clearing out and now we got a tongue lashing. Because by now we've ramped up the opposition. Oh, yeah. Yep. Big time. Because remember, all this other stuff was happening off somewhere and they would have to go yeah. investigate. Now we're in home base, yep. which is now, right. I do think them. this is interesting because this is going to help us with this apocalyptic language that's used in all four <clears throat> books. Yep. That maybe not John's. But uh, so he goes to the Mount of Olives. I've been to the Mount of Olives. It overlooks Jerusalem. So there with the Jerusalem in the background. Yep. I mean, if you're standing there and you read what he said, you're like, Oh mm, yeah. It, it, it completely changed my life when I was standing there. It, it made me realize he was looking out there about, let me tell you what's fixed to happen here. Yeah. Yeah. So same, same thing in Acts 18 with Paul knowing on Mars Hill, once you stand on Mars Hill and you see the Acropolis right behind you, it makes a lot more sense. It makes perfect sense. So hang on, Jess, let's take another break. Now, meanwhile, while Jesus is giving the speech, either this Tuesday or Wednesday, which is day four, Judas is negotiating this betrayal. Mm -hmm. So, and Jesus, Tuesday, that night, back to Bethany. Yep. Makes the trek back. So now day four, Wednesday. Which is about two miles, by the way. Which is called Spy Wednesday in the re by some religious groups because that's back to the Judas. Yeah. Uh, you know, Judas has this negotiation going on of betrayal. Now, from what I gathered, there's a couple of discrepancies. Most scholars do not 
have anything that Jesus did on Wednesday, which I found kind of fascinating. Now, there was a couple things, but it made me just think, because basically now we're this is the day before this whole thing is going down. I mean, it escalates quickly when you get to day five, because then when you're going to have the upper room, day five, the upper room, uh, you know, the prep for the Passover feast, which is going to be really important when we compare what happened in the Passover. Where is that? Exodus uh, 12 to this meal. That, and I'm going to propose that they went from, under Judaism, eating a lamb, slaughtering and eating a lamb for acknowledging their sins. Sin covering, yeah. Yeah, to Jesus introducing an idea that the lamb is no longer on the table. It's, That's right. It's with you at the table. He's declaring himself the lamb of God here. But we'll, we'll go through that. So he has Which is the, why I call it the last Passover or really the first new. I mean, either one. It was a transitional meal. There's yeah, no Missy about. and I was talking about this last night because I we were going because Missy did a great blog a year or two ago. Mm-hmm. I think we had her own, and she talked about it. She did. You can go to missyrobertson dot com and and read it, but it goes through the last seven days. And so uh, this is where he also washed disciples' feet. Then you have later that night the garden. This is day five Thursday. The Garden of Gethsemane. You remember when he prayed and and with tears. Then you have the actual betrayal. Yeah. By the kiss, he's arrested. You have Peter's denial. That was a pretty big day. So then you have day six, which is the crucifixion day, mm-hmm. the trial, scourge, the yeah, the scourge, Pilate, all that. Have the death and the burial, and then Saturday, you know, the day Jesus's body's in the tomb. And there's a lot of things that happen there. We'll talk about Nicodemus and uh, who was that? Joseph. Yeah, Arimathea. Yeah. yeah, and then Sunday, which is day eight. Now this is. This is why I asked that original question. If you only had a week to die, because that's what we have. But he had a week, you know, to live. Because here in day eight, Sunday, something happened that was real hard for us to all get our heads wrapped around. But he came back to life. So that's that's the outline of what's fixed at the last five chapters. Right. And and it's good to know that because when when it makes more sense when we start into it. And why this was such a big deal. Like you described, yeah. Jace, it, it almost seems, because it's the donkey and all this fulfilling prophecy, but this is actually the trigger that starts the passion. I mean, this is the trigger that starts it all, which basically not only ended and changed how Judaism had been, but also is the seedlings for yeah. offering salvation for everyone. Yeah, and I would I would argue, too, that, that when we read the passion of Christ, not to divorce it from the coming of the kingdom because in, in verse nine, whatever, and this is in Mark 11, nine, it says those who went in front and those who followed, they were shouting and they're quoting out of Psalms here. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David, Hosanna in the highest. So they knew that what, 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 what with this progression of Jesus in, in this triumphal entry they they knew rightly so that this was kind of this coming of the kingdom of God. What they didn't know was what that was going to be like. They right. they had no concept of what it would be, but they they got at least got it right that like something's happening here. They knew the prophecies. They knew the Daniel two stuff. They knew all of Daniel seven, all that, and they knew there's something happening. This guy's fulfilling the prophecy out of Zechariah. There's the coming of the kingdom, and I think it's um, not here on accident. I don't think that Jesus just randomly goes to the temple whenever he goes down into the in, into Jerusalem the first place he went was to the temple and, and he looks around and he sees everything and he and you know you it, it doesn't say this but it but it kind of implies it because of what happens uh, the next day you know he's he's looking around and what do you think you saw no, he's, he saw the, all this stuff he was going to have to deal with the next day yeah so he's, it, it <laughs> was, he's the outer part of it which is is turned into you know, it's turned into uh, Wall Street. You know, yeah, it, it was what he's looking at. It's just it's commerce. Yeah, and, it's, and they had, see what they had. They had actually brought um, into the inner part of the temple. They had brought. They had actually moved the the marketplace inside. That's right. Because this is where you would go if you if you showed up, you didn't have a sacrifice. Well, you just hey, we got that offered here for you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But they were selling the doves tent like it was the doves they were selling, which was for the poor people. Right. But think about what they're doing. Really, really. 
they're using God to make money. Yeah. Instead of they're selling being, forgiveness, being used by God to help, you know, and, share and, Jesus. And I think, it, I, think it's, or, I think it's so key to understand that the temple in the Old Testament that it was it was first before it was a temple. What was it? There was a tabernacle. Yep. And the tabernacle and the temple both were the place where kind of heaven and earth kind of meet in the presence of God. Like yep. this is where you would go to experience the presence of God. This is where God, this was God's house. You know, this is where God dwells. And so when Jesus came, I would listen to a, a sermon on Mark 11 from um, one guy. And he said, um, he said that in John 1, 1, when it says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And then John, I think John 1, 14 says that uh, and the word became flesh Made his dwelling dwelt place. among us. Yep. Uh, he said that that word is is it's it's is God may he got tabernacled with us. God tabernacled, yeah. yeah. Like God's presence came, and so when you had this moment here, where Jesus goes into the temple, and everybody said, "The kingdom of God's here. The kingdom of David. The kingdom of David's here." And and here's the here's the new king, and he's riding down. He says, "Yep, I'm I'm the king. You're correct." But you but in his back of his mind, he's thinking, "But you have no idea what's about to happen." He goes to the temple, the place, the meeting place where heaven and earth meet, and he looks at what's happened to it, and he's like, "This thing's going down. This temple is going down." And that's why the very next passage, when it talks about the fig tree that's cursed, it's a representation of Israel that, that you have all of the outer. It, it looks good on the outside, so, but, but, but you, there's no fruit. Right. Right. Which is kind yeah. of a pr- prophecy of the coming of the Holy Spirit yep. in Galatians chapter five, when it says you receive the fruit of the spirit. Right. There's a whole lot of implications there. But he, he curses the fig tree. Because there's not that he hates fig trees. It's just that you're. It's not producing any fruit. This is not what this was meant to be. This is yeah. you've missed it, the whole it thing. Has to fill in with this whole thing. Let's take our last break. Well, if you think about it, I mean, we'll get there. But what's the difference, looking wise, of a fake tree, especially now, <clears throat> and a real tree? I mean, you half the trees. In my house, because my wife is into plants, half of them are not even real. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, babe, why would you have something that's not real? I mean, I, I just, I was against that. Because it looks good. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I brought up yeah. this passage. Yeah, she needs to be rebuked. <laughs> I, I, I did. I, I rebuked. needs yeah. to start it, cursing those fake trees. It, yeah. I think she responded with, stay in your lane. Bro. <laughs> 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 but my point is, the real difference is one of them is not only does one of them produce fruit, the other one can never produce fruit. Yeah. It, it, you can't get it out of there. And I, I, when you look at all the passages where Jesus said, I am the vine, I am the tree, or what about the one where he says, unless a seed dies? Yep. Yeah. So it, around it, your household, no more plastic trees. Now he lost well, that battle. No, I, I, I mean, I predicted Phil, he lost that battle. I gave the rebuke. <laughs> I said my my case you strongly. Stood your ground, but it did not produce repentance. <laughs> repentance did not occur. And I do think what you'll learn in marriage is that there are some things worth going to the mattresses over, and there are some things. I don't know if that's that, the right David, analogy. That was there. my joke. That was my joke. Okay, I got you. I got it. Okay. Read I between the lines. Okay. okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, yeah. I, I, well, I, there's some things that will keep you from going to the mattresses over. Oh, there you go. There you go. Okay. okay. So, well, but, but I, you brought up a good point about the, the connection to David. And I want to explain that a little bit because the audience may not realize this. All the kings of Israel. All of them. Once they split, all this, God only picked one to be His guy, and it was David. And David was flawed, and you know they had some. He wouldn't even let him build a temple because he had so much blood on his hands. He said, yeah. so he was a warrior, but he was a poet. He was a musician. He was David was a very interesting person, but he made an eternal covenant with David. He said, "The, the eternal kingdom will come from you." Your lineage, and and then of course the kingdom goes, it splits. You got all these different things. There was something very unique and special about that relationship God had with David, and that's why He made that thing with him. So it, what's interesting is these guys realized this in the moment. Oh, I think they knew that, that, that they linked it all the well, way back. No, you, you go read uh, Genesis forty nine. There's even a, a, a when 
Jacob gives the blessing to Judah. Yeah. How held the lion of Judah. That's right. And there's this picture of of kind of God's sovereignty and power and kingship, mainly in the coming of the Christ. But it references this the cult and the donkey. Oh and, no, you're right. And all of I this. read it last night. Yeah. Yeah, I read that. But what that's why I wanted to say though, don't miss the forest for the trees. The reason you're seeing all of the in my opinion, this is my take on it, but the reason you're seeing, okay, yes, he you know he has love and tears and compassion, but you're also seeing some sternness and you're seeing a tree get withered and you're hearing him call people son of vipers and cuz you're seeing all God's qualities come together on the cross which is justice holiness love wrath because once Jesus declared publicly I I I'm the king what that did was well for people who research this and have this encounter with Jesus like us well we love it we we see Man, God's love has no bounds. Look at what it took for him to pay the debt of not only our sins, but the sin of the world. That's why we'll get over into the Passover and all this tradition that they've been doing for years, killing all these lambs. and Because that shows you the seriousness of sin. They, they understood why God did that, because there is a debt that must be paid. Now, later on, after resurrection, they're like, Oh, and he just paid. It. He's the lamb. You know that these little sayings that yeah. you hear from John the Baptist when he said, "Look, behold, the, the lamb, lamb of, of God. God takes away the sins of the world." He, he understood it. Yep. The woman pouring out the perfume that just happened. It yep. just happened before this. Yep. Jesus defended her because he's like she knows what's fixed to happen. So some people were make con- which look, it's incredible faith and incredible imagination yep. for them. To get what, that this is the Son of God, this is the King. Yep. It's a, a, it still is. But what it what it what it made me think, and this was my final analysis on it, is that when Jesus by coming out in public, he's basically saying, "Crown me, or kill me," and and that the line was drawn because it's making one side furious. It's making the people, the believers. It made me think about that verse in Revelation three where it said. I wish you'd, you know, some of you are hot, some of you are cold, because you're lukewarm, it spits you out of my mouth. Because you think it's about loud here, yeah. you, you think about the rich young ruler, you start thinking about all these stories. He's like, I want all of you or none of you. Yeah. You you can't, this is not something you're just going to muse like, oh, let me add this Jesus element to my religiosity. Yeah. It was a declaration of that God is here. I'm the well, king, and because he's he's completely disrupting. Not they, disrupting is a, a strong enough word. He's he, exploding. He's exploding their paradigm and their yeah. system, and he's doing it in the most provocative of ways because he's basically saying the law and the prophets, I am, and exactly. now he's saying the temple, I am, and yeah. that, it, it, the temple's going down in 35 years after Jesus' crucifixion. But it's, he's it, actually challenging the response. Tell I me, mean, you remember Nicodemus? Yeah. He was like, well, what, what must I do? The rich young ruler, what what, what do I lack? And he explodes it. He's like, you need to be born again. Yeah. This is a complete explosion yep. and then a transformation and a new creation. It, it, it's almost like it's it's almost like it's new wine being poured into old wineskins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, that's what it, that's what well, it sounds like. And look, you a fist bump on that. Uh, Jay, this is to, to your I just thought about this conversation. You've got examples. Here's another one in John 18 when the conversation with Pilate and Jesus. G, Pilate says, take him yourselves, judge him by your own law. In other words, he's like, I don't have anything to do with this. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. To your point, just to crown me or kill me. Pilate then went back inside the palace. Some of Jesus said, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your idea or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate said? It was your people that handed you over to me. What is it you've done? My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent any arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. I mean, I don't know how you get around it. I mean, this is the coming of the kingdom. And you say, well, what, what did he say? What, what kind of stuff did he say that, that would make these people mad enough to kill him? Here, here's one thing in Mark 11. He, whenever he walks into the temple and sees what they've done to it, and, the, and there's merchandise that's moving its way through the temple, he said he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise at the temple. And he began to teach them. He said, "It's is it not written 
My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, which is indicative of his inclusion of the Gentiles. Correct. But you have made it a robber's den. Now, if you call, he's talking to the religious leaders, the ones who were the power brokers in this system. Mm-hmm. And he said the, the thing that they held in the highest, uh, supposedly held in the highest regard and esteem was the temple. And he said, you've made it a robber's den. And he actually called it his house. Yeah. He said, you've taken my house and made it into and a, Which a was interesting thing. because and then one of the, ver- one of the different uh, gospels says the disciples remembered the verse that said, the zeal for my father's house, which was interesting. Well, you I know, I know we got to go to overtime, but yeah. I want to say this because there's going to be a theme and I, and somebody, I'm not sure where I got this from, but somebody, I read this somewhere and I want to say it because I think one of the biggest arguments that people have is, is wondering why Jesus had to die. Yeah. We get that uh, question they, constantly. They, 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 it's the number one question. And I read this somewhere because I think in the last week of his life, and and the reason I I started this off with that question is because whatever we come up with, because you'll probably be devastated when they tell you you got a week to live. But Jesus embraced it, and he did way better than anybody else will do. But I want to make this quote because the reason we have a hard time wrapping our brains around why Jesus died the way he did and came riding a donkey and all. That's what people are like. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. So I read this somewhere. Sin is a servant or a human putting themselves as king. Salvation is the king putting himself as a human or a servant. When you you think, now look, it's hard to wrap your head around that. So I'm going to read it again. Sin is a servant putting themselves as a king. Because we want to be king. Life is not, we, it, we want to do, we want to be king. Mm-hmm. Salvation is the king putting himself as a servant, which is what Jesus did yeah. when, when he came here. Which is what he kept telling his disciples. All right, but that's, we got, we'll need to unpack that a little bit, Jason, in our overtime. So if you want to follow us over, it's blazetv.com slash unashamed. If you use the promo code Phil, you're going to get $10 off that subscription. So check us out. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.